I would like to um, introduce somebody who has been kind enough in order to spend time. You can always hear me, um, even if you don't want to, but this gentleman is somebody who is difficult to get hold of. Um, he has a distinctly decorated, a very decorated um, career, and therefore, if I read out the entire introduction, I think the next 20 minutes will, uh, would, would, would elapse if I were to read out all of what he's achieved. So I, in, in a nutshell, I'm going to try to do justice to his illustrious career. So please forgive me if I uh, make any error. But from uh, the time he joined the, the Navy, he uh, got the award of best cadet. And then after that, he went ahead and he uh, won the award of telescope. And I think from the telescope, probably he's probably uh, he... Uh, saw the northern star and he fixed um, himself like he promised himself saying i'm going to reach the highest echelon of the indian navy from there i think it's only a journey that was upward he served as the chief uh, the chief of the eastern naval command in vishakhapatnam the chief staff officer at the western naval command uh, from one rank to another he kept increasing and then eventually he served as the Naval Advisor to the High Commission and then thereafter the Vice Chief of Naval Staff and then of course the most decorated which was the 22nd Chief of Indian Naval Staff. The, uh, it is a pleasure and a privilege to be able to welcome PVSM, AVSM, YSM, ADC. I only wish I had those many titles in um, I, I wish I had one of those many, the number of titles that he has. And in his case, these are the actual titles. In my case, it's just the school trophies that I've won, which are yet uh, staring and looking down at me and saying, Rishabh, uh, by your age, he had achieved so much more. I think he's an inspiration to both me and I'm pretty sure to all of you because he's distinctly served our country. And he served our country as uh, the Naval Chief, after which he was also the Chief of uh, the Foundation for the Indian Navy uh, for a while. And thereafter, I troubled him and I asked him saying, sir, uh, there are many, don many caps that you are yet donning, but can you add an other cap um, on the very many that you wear? And um, it gives me great pleasure, honor, that we can call him today and invite him as an advisor. And of course, the chief guest for the I'm on Digital Concourse. It is on behalf of the Ayman family, sir. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be able to welcome the 22nd Chief of Indian Navy, Admiral R.K. Doba. Sir, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rishabh. It's indeed a pleasure. Uh, so, so the members of the II, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So before you begin, may I ask you a slightly lighthearted question? So this is a question that a lot of people have been asking me. Uh, before, before you begin, can I ask you this one lighthearted question? Yes, please. Yes, and go ahead. Everyone's been asking me, saying, uh, it is Admiral R.K. Dhovan. So what is, is, is he related to, is he the second cousin to this wonderful cricketer called Shikhar Dhawan? And I said, the, the, probably there is no similarity, but I'm going to ask sir this question. Uh, of course, this makes me look very silly. But then again, I'm wearing a t-shirt and sir is wearing a three-piece suit. This basically uh, speaks volume of the man. Uh, over to you, sir. Please do not, uh, do not even bother answering it. It's absolutely fine. No, I will certainly answer. Every question needs to be answered. I am not uh, related at all to uh, Shikhar Dhawan. But then the world is one family. So I'm sure that somewhere since the... Dhavan surname is there. I spell it a little differently and he does differently. I spell it with a no, uh, which I like to uh, believe is the uh, 21st century fox spellings. Uh, but uh, so we are, but I'm sure we are related in some way and I admire him as a cricketer. So that much for the uh, introduction. But thank you very much, uh, Rishab, for all those nice words you've said. Uh, boys and girls, uh, members of the IIMUN family, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a distinct uh, pleasure and a privilege uh, for which I need to thank Rishabh, which he has uh, afforded me this opportunity 
that I could speak and uh, share my thoughts with all of you, whom I consider as the leaders of the new India or the leaders of the future of India. We're going to be talking on a serious subject, but then as I go along, I will temper it to indicate as to where the children of the 21st century come in in taking on these challenges. As you're all aware, the, we are faced with a serious challenge, which is called the coronavirus uh, pandemic. And it has uh, impacted every aspect of our life. And as far as disasters go, it is perhaps the biggest disaster since the Second World War. Uh, it has been a health crisis, an economic disaster, a humanitarian as well as a social crisis. But to the children of the 21st century, which I believe all of you are, uh, Rishabh tells me that most of you have been born in the current century. I think you have to have a different take. I would like to say that you need to take on this challenge in your stride because you are the children of the 21st century and there are going to be many, many more such challenges uh, wars, uh, pandemics, and uh, what have you, which will come your way as you negotiate and navigate through the better part of this century, which is your century. So I'm sure that what you need to actually do is to be gearing up and arming yourself to take on this challenge and many more challenges like this. And what you need to do is to make a resolve that you will imbibe the spirit of a challenger, the mind of a visionary, the quest of a researcher, and the discipline of a soldier. Not very easy, but you can do it. So I would like to also say that, you know, challenges in life and challenges in every century have been there. It's not that uh, this pandemic has come along and it is the biggest, it is currently the biggest challenge which you perhaps have seen in your lifetime. But every century, children and adults alike have faced many, many challenges. And I would like to relate this by taking all of you back one century ago and talk about the children of the 20th century. And to make it uh, realistic, I would like to relate it to the life of a child of the 21st century who was born on 1st January, 1900. And uh, that child is nobody else but my maternal grandfather, Dr. Bhagat Ram Sagar. Now look what he went through in life. By the time he was 14 years old, the First World War broke out. And that continued till he was 18 years old. And do you know that we lost 22 million people during the First World War alone. But all along, this child did not give up his resolve. Actually, he made up his mind that he would give up the family business of being cloth merchants and become a doctor. And in his 20s, he became a doctor. At the age of 23, he got married to my grandmother. And now, Life is going on around him in the world. I told you by the time he was 18, that's the time till the World War was still going on, the First World War. The very next year, by the time he's 19 years of age, the Spanish flu started, which went on for another year or two. And you know that we lost nearly 50 million people during the Spanish flu. But that did not uh, temper the spirit of this young lad who was now in his 20s, married and a doctor. And then he started sailing all over the world. Yes, in those days when it was very difficult to sail on the high seas, he took his young wife and children as they came along and he traveled. What was he doing traveling the world? He was spreading Indian culture and heritage and establishing educational institutions all over the world. Specifically, he traveled to Southeast Asia and then he spoke about establishing what we know as the Arya Samaj. And many years I went back to Singapore 
And in 1927, at the age of 27, he established the RS Samaj in Singapore. And even today, there is a DAV school there with his name as the founder of the RS Samaj. He's only 27. Now life again continues and then he doesn't stop at that. He travels by sea to Africa and does the same thing. He spreads Indian culture, heritage, make people aware, and he establishes the RS Samaj in Africa. Now the world is going on and then the deep depression comes along, which is around 1929-1930. But 1930 he travels to London to be part of the peace conference. And this is this young lad, which as the world is going around various troubles happening from world wars to Spanish flus to the uh, various other uh, problems of depression, but he goes along. Gets back to India and in 1936, he establishes an educational institution in Lahore, which later shifted to uh, Amritsar and then to Delhi. And even today, those educational institutions are running. But while the world wars, etc., are happening, we comes along the Second World War at the age when he's 39 and continues till he's 45 years old. And in the Second World War, we lost nearly 75 million people. Look at the kind of tragedy that's happening all along the world. And it's not as if all was well in India. We were fighting the freedom struggle, as you know. And among all this, he had to move from Lahore to Amritsar, where I was born in 1954, and later to Delhi. The purpose of telling you this is that in every century, in every lifetime, every individual has to face many challenges. But this story of this young lad, my grandfather, gives you an idea that you have to make a resolve, you have to do something that you want to achieve in life, and you will achieve it. Many years later, as a young boy, when I remember very vividly visiting his house. The nameplate outside his house was what struck in my mind even today. It said, Dr. Bhagat Ram Segal, world tourist. That is what he liked to call himself, having traveled all over the world. So that is the story, and that gives you an idea that you have to be there to face challenges and make yourself strong to face those challenges. So the challenge that we currently have in front of us, let us not undermine the adversary. The, uh, it's the invisible enemy, as we call it, the coronavirus. And as you know, it's caused disaster all across the world. We are fortunate because uh, when you have extraordinary circumstances, you need to take some extraordinary actions. And uh, in India, uh, the country has been united under our Honorable Prime Minister, our leader who's taken some very decisive actions early on to have the lockdown, to have the testing started, the screening, containment zones, and the war is being fought on many fronts. We must also not forget the corona warriors, which range from the doctors to the health workers to the sanitation workers, people who are ensuring that the essential supplies are ensured, the logistics people, you have the police, the paramilitary forces, and of course the armed forces, which are doing a lot behind the scenes because the armed forces, as you know, are always there to make sure that our frontiers, whether it's the land frontier, the sea frontiers, or the frontiers in the air, are always secure and safe. At the same time, they're always there to help out with disaster relief, which is one of their benign roles. And in this, the hospitals, the armed forces hospitals, which are spread across the country under the commands of the Army, Navy, and Air Force, have been made available to assist the various states in the fight against coronavirus. As you know, we evacuated many Indians from overseas, even by naval ships, the logistic flights that were carried out, and the disaster relief, which has been carried out by the armed forces personnel and the Army, and so on. So today also is the day that we must take a minute off and salute all the corona warriors who are out there in this fight against this pandemic and trying to keep us safe. Parallelly, as I said, the war is on many fronts. The country has announced, the government has announced a substantial financial stimulus to make sure that every section of the society is helped, whether it's the farmers, whether it's the poor 
daily wage workers, whether it's the MSMEs, whether it's the industry, all of them will be assisted by the stimulus package. And today we are at a transition where now there is a very careful balance between saving lives and livelihood. And effort is now on to crank up and bring the economy back on track so that while we are fighting the uh, coronavirus, we are also making sure that we revive our economy. Now, this is the opportunity that is there for you, which has been provided by a challenge. And as, as they say, every challenge also brings along an opportunity. You have the opportunity where you have some extra time with you because the schools and colleges are closed and perhaps the exams which are to be there have been postponed. You have a little more time to reflect. What should you do with that time? My suggestion is that you should take that time to reflect as to how you can make yourself stronger. Stronger in every which way because you have to arm yourself with knowledge, which is the greatest weapon you can ever have and will come in handy to take, uh, to actually fight many challenges which will come across in the life. You have to make yourself physically strong. You have to make yourself healthy. You have to make actually yourself immune against many of these viruses and many of these challenges. Now to do this, there are many ways you can do it. But I would like to suggest what I have called the C4I qualities that you need to imbibe. C4 standing for the four C's of commitment, compassion, courage, credibility, and I for integrity. By commitment, I mean that this is the commitment towards your studies towards your future career, commitment towards your future profession, you must at this point in time, reflect and plan as what do you want to be? What do you want to do in life? And this is where you need to actually fly and dream as far as the moon, if it were, because it should not be any ordinary vision. You need to aim high. You need to aim what would you like to do. Remember, this is going to be different for different people. Every child, every human being is different. You have different intellects. You have different aptitudes. You have different qualities. But you must set your goals and your missions high according to your aptitude, what you would like to do. Listen to everybody, listen to your parents, listen to your peers, listen to your friends, but decide on what you would like to do because only then you would be happy in doing whatever you have set your aims on. Whatever you decide is your choice, but there'll be two suggestions from my side. Make sure you're choosing something which is of a creative nature. That is what will ultimately make you happy in the years and decades to come. Secondly, whatever you want to do must have some element of giving something back to the society, to your nation, to humanity. If these are followed, you will be happy with whatever you do. But I feel that overall, this is with experience, I say, that in later years, it will give you a lot of job satisfaction in what you're choosing to do in life. But once you have made that commitment, once you have set your goals, then you must put your heart and soul into achieving the aim. You may have to tweak and navigate and make some course corrections along the way, but don't lose your focus once you made your commitment. The second C we talked about I'd like to tell you about is compassion. Compassion towards your colleagues, compassion towards your friends, compassion towards fellow students, compassion later in life to people whom you work with and maybe people whom you may lead as a leader. For this, you need to understand one basic thing, that no single individual 
however brilliant he, he or she may be, can achieve anything on his or her own. It has to be teamwork. And therefore, you need to understand the strength and weakness of each member of your colleagues or your team so that you can work shoulder to shoulder with them with compassion to achieve your aim or your goal. So teamwork is very important and you need to work together as a team with compassion. That is when you will learn what compassion really means. The third one is courage. The third C is for courage. And courage is in two parts. One is physical courage. I mentioned to you, you need to have the spirit of the challenger. So you need to have the courage to face coronavirus. You are not going to bash on regardless. You're going to do, if you have to talk about uh, being challenging the coronavirus, you'll take all precautions, washing hands, to wearing face masks, social distancing, but you do not have to fear anything. You have to have the spirit in you to take on a challenge and the courage to take the challenge and come out of adversity with flying colors. So in life, as I gave you the example, you'll be faced with many challenges. Challenges in your studies, challenges in your career, physical challenge if you are in a particular situation, never be afraid. Because if you are afraid or fearful, you will never be able to achieve your dreams. So have that physical courage to take on a challenge and come out of it, that adversity with flying colors. The second part of courage is moral courage. Moral courage means that there'll be many times in life when you are at a crossroad and you have the right path, which seems difficult, and the wrong part, which seems easy. You must have the moral courage to choose the right over the wrong, even though it will be more difficult. Easier said than done. But then, if you're going to be building character, if you're going to be building yourself to take on challenges of the future, this is a quality of moral courage which you will need to imbibe. The fourth C is credibility. Credibility as a student, credibility as an individual, credibility as a professional is something which you will have to build painstakingly over the years because it will precede you wherever you go. Today you're a student and you may be a topper and that is a quality which precedes you when you go for admission to a university. But I have a bit of advice here as well, that when you are developing your capabilities, try and develop an all-round personality. Just as an example, don't just try to excel in academics. You may do very well up to the school level, get admission in a great university, but experience tells you that it is an all-rounder. It's an all-rounder who does well in life later. So whether it's articulation skills in speech and writing, whether it's extracurricular activities, whether it's knowing various things apart from your basic academics, it is the all-round development of your personality which you need to develop so that you will have the credibility, which as I said, will precede you wherever you go. If you're gonna be a doctor, try and have the credibility of being the best in your line, the best in your profession. If you're going to be uh, in the marketing field, if you're going to be in whatever field, in the, as an artist or as whatever you want to do, but try to excel in that so that you have a credibility. And finally, encompassing all the four sees is the I, which is integrity, which has to be beyond doubt always and every time, because nobody should be able to ever doubt your integrity. So these are the basic qualities, as I said, which you need to imbibe. This is the right time 
when the coronavirus has given you some time when you're in lockdown conditions or not going out so much or not have so much pressure of your studies, when you need to look at building up these qualities so that you will emerge from this, as, as I said, physically strong, mentally strong, and imbibe all the essentials of the spirit of a challenger, the mind of a visionary, the quest of a researcher, and the discipline of a soldier. So I hope that you will take this suggestion and advice and get ready to face the world of the 21st century post coronavirus, where you have to actually go out and conquer the world, where you have to set your goals. And I hope that you will achieve this with honor and glory and bring honor and glory to yourself, to your family, to your school, to your nation and always ensure that the flag of India, the tricolor flag of your country always flies high. Thank you and Jai Hind. I'd be happy to take on any question that you may have. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for, that, for those kind words. I think what you said about the four C's, the integrity, um, I think uh, the entire speech that you gave was so relevant. It, uh, you, you narrated your, the, the journey of your grandfather uh, from 1900 and then thereafter. And I think by 27, so by the time he was uh, as old as me, had actually gone ahead and established a school um, in another place. So um, it, there's so much of learning in what you just said. Uh, you did also mention, and if I may, you said that at the end of COVID, uh, we will be in a position to be, we should be physically stronger and also mentally stronger. Um, the problem, sir, with, uh, with me personally is that the amount of food that I'm consuming uh, is, so far, is, is so much that, that physically stronger I do not know about, but the mentally stronger for sure is something that is definitely going to happen. Uh, but sir, you, you mentioned lot many points and therefore uh, I'm going to leave my tomfoolery and actually uh, let young people ask you questions that they have. So all hands on board, I cannot say. So I will say all hands on the keyboard. So if you have any questions, I'll be the happiest in order to recognize any questions to sir. And because we're seeing far too many, uh, can we start with a boy called Ishan Kotiar? Yes. A very good afternoon to you, sir. It's an absolute honor to be interacting with you. So my question is as follows. So China has for a long time, and especially during the pandemic, tried to push its borders out into the international waters. The speed and scale of this military aggression is quite unprecedented. There have been multiple instances of how the Chinese regime is trying to wage a silent war such as the encroachment of Indonesian fisheries near the Natuna Islands, the Taiwanese waters, or the Paracel Islands near Vietnam. What, according to you, can be the steps that the international community as well as India take in order to counter this appalling strategy? A uh, very good question, Nishan. And uh, you're absolutely right uh, that on one end we had uh, China, where is where the virus started from. But it hasn't uh, really stopped it from the activities in the South China Sea, where we see some uh, aggressive action. And uh, it is not now, it has been there for some time now. And as you know, certain artificial islands have been constructed there because uh, the laws of the seas uh, make uh, some very, very, uh, the islands and what the exclusive economic zone it brings around very, very valuable. And therefore, the laws of the sea were actually uh, being challenged. So this is where uh, the uh, navies or the maritime powers of the world have been looking at this very carefully. As you're aware, the United States uh, uh, Navy, uh, along with some other naval ships, are even uh, deployed as we speak uh, to make sure that the freedom of navigation is maintained. I would just like to uh, dwell a little and uh, apprise uh, you and everybody else, I'm sure you know, perhaps some others don't, that uh, when we talk about the seas and the maritime domain, it's a totally different environment uh, compared to, let's say, the Army and the Air Force. So when we talk about uh, land borders, uh, you can think of land borders and you can look at fencing that can be done. 
and you can demarcate borders which can be there. And let me give a, actually an example to you. Uh, if the army uh, was to find people or soldiers from another army peering down the pickets one morning, it'll be cause for grave alarm. Why? Because the land border has been violated and the soldiers from another army are now peering down the pickets. If an Air Force fighter aircraft had a fighter aircraft from another Air Force flying in its vicinity, it will be cause for even graver alarm. Why? Because the airspace has now been violated and another Air Force aircraft has got into your airspace. But as far as the maritime domain or the sea is concerned, it is all international waters. Out at sea, when the ops of the watch reports to the captain that we have a warship from another Navy on the starboard bow, the captain tells him, son, flash to him good morning, because she's in international waters and so are you. Now, that is the challenge as far as the maritime domain is concerned. There are no boundaries on the high seas. There is no fencing of borders. And what we call the high seas is the global commons through which trade should be passing unrestricted. Just to give you an example, 120,000 ships pass through the Indian Ocean every year, carrying 66% of the world's oil, 50% of the world's container traffic, 33% of the world's cargo traffic. A large percentage of this also passes through the South China Sea, which is actually international waters. And now what China has done is that by these artificial islands, they have the nine dash line and they would like to indicate and change the rule of the law or the law of the sea and try and impose certain restrictions. Now this is being resisted by countries like India, like United States and other like-minded countries. Because as you said, we have the Parasol Islands, we have the Spratly Islands, and there is disputes with all the other countries of the region, whether it's Malaysia, whether it's uh, Vietnam and so on. So what needs to be done is to make sure that we have to have China talking and working towards a rules-based international order. That is, the meaning of that is that we need to follow rules and regulations. Can you imagine 90% of the world's trade transits by sea? And if there is any impediment to the free flow of that oil or trade, it would have a detrimental impact, not just on the economies of the region, but the global economy as well. And who's going to get affected if the world trade gets affected? China too, because it also relies for its economy on the world trade. So this is where the world countries of the world are talk, not just talking, but taking action as well to see that we observe and abide by a rules-based international order. Actually, the Honorable Prime Minister, uh, Sri Narendra Modi, in his uh, talk at the Shangri-La Dialogue in June 2018, spoke exactly of this. He spoke about a rules-based international order. And if one of the lines I can quote, he said that India will promote a democratic rules-based international order in which all countries, big and small, should thrive as equals. And to achieve this, India will engage the world in peace, with respect, through dialogue, and with total commitment to international law. So that is going to be the way of the future. And we can see that it has to be, the aim will be, my, my suggestion would be that it has to be cooperation rather than confrontation, where we have to make China understand that it needs to abide by a rules-based international order. Well, thank, thank you, sir, for, uh, for that answer. I think uh, 
the whatever happens in china um this is again uh, you know the 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 string of pearls the the counter string of pearl strategy that india then has um, and nations in and around have have adopted so it's um, but but those insights so we keep reading and discussing about this uh, in our conferences we get young people to talk about this but uh, your insights of course are invaluable uh, like you said the prime minister has embarked on the mission of also apart from this a make in india mission um it's surprising that something that uh, seems to have been made in china has lasted this long but uh, then again uh, so moving forward from from this topic um, i will recognize next somebody from the harry potter committee we have a few committees that are lighter committees where students get to discuss uh, um, the the not so um, difficult topics and therefore if i could request rishi to shift focus to amelia bones from the harry potter council please hi i'm muted hello good evening sir good evening am i audible okay sir yeah, i can hear you. i have always wanted to become a to become an engineer part of us have wanted to become a naval officer or something like that and it's especially I'm a female. How can I become an officer, army officer, or a pilot, or something like that? Well, um, uh, uh, I didn't get your name. Sir, I'm Swati. Sorry. I'm Swati. Swati. Okay. Swati, uh, the future is very bright for you. if you would like to become a naval officer the uh, you have all the opportunity um, as you are aware uh, we already have uh, uh, naval women naval officers in the navy uh, so far they have been in uh, specific uh, branches and um, uh, that is in the education and the field of construction of course you can be a medical officer you can be in the education or the logistics field but we also have uh women observers till now an observer is um, uh, an, a women officer who fly flies in our maritime reconnaissance and patrol aircraft and they are the ones who actually sit on the radar consoles and and with all the uh, sensors and they operate that and they fly in these aircraft and uh, in, in future uh, you know i can see that there could be an opportunity to actually fly a pilot as well so i think uh, that uh, you should not curb uh, your enthusiasm or your desire to be uh, firstly a naval officer so go ahead and um, uh, pass the examinations and recruit yourself at the indian naval academy and then undergo all the training uh, to start off at this point in time to be an uh, observer in the maritime reconnaissance and patrol aircraft and who knows by the time um, you get long you may even get an opportunity uh, to become a fighter pilot in the indian navy and fly from the decks of ships so all the very best to you swati and i can see that you will have a very bright future as a naval officer tomorrow perfect well uh, thank you i think as i'm looking at you a lot of people want to join the indian navy and i think uh, that that desire is only increasing uh and let me take the final two questions with your permission sir yeah yeah we could do that but before you uh, say that you know uh, people wanting to join the navy it just remind me of a, a few months ago uh, i was in canada uh, with my uh, uh, daughter and uh, son in law and we have uh, two uh, grandsons and the older one of them is 6 uh, years old so i was invited to uh, speak to all of them uh, at the uh, school which i did and uh, at the end of it uh, when i said how many want to join the navy the entire class the hand went up uh, my grandson was very disappointed because he thought that he was the only one who was going to be joining the navy <laughs> uh, like nanu but you know his problem is uh, different he, he wants to join the navy to be a chief and to be an admiral uh, so uh, he has a sight set state so when all his class uh, put up the hands he says nanu there are going to be many chiefs in the navy at this rate so it is important to understand for uh, everybody that you can all join the navy 
but you have to really work hard because it's a pyramid and there can be many officers, but there can be only one chief. So, uh, so that much for the ambition of youngsters today. <laughs> uh, very rightly said, but I think so the most fulfilling thing is to be able to contribute to India. And um, as much as your grandfather did, as much as normal people and so many people across do contribute to the country in their own way, and help in nation building. I think um, the people who are most selfless and who have uh, altruism imbibed in them are people who serve uh, distinctly in the Army, Navy and Air Force. And I think that, I think for young people, the ability to be able to serve our country, I think that is something that you inspire them to do. So, uh, but, but then sir, I will move to the next question. There was a question from the student who is representing delegate, who is the delegate of Ghana in the UN ODC. If you can introduce yourself and then start, please. Um, uh, good afternoon, sir. Um, I'm Goranj Aruda of uh, Scholars of Senior Secondary School, Rohatak Haryana. You're audible. I can hear you. Go ahead. Sorry, the video is uh, frozen for me. Okay. Um, so, uh, my question is that uh, how Brexit and UK, how they left uh, EU, how they left uh, the European Union. So, how do you think that uh, UK will be affected economically uh, because of it and the foreign relations will be affected of uh, UK um, that of the, with the non-European countries? Well, I think that uh, certainly uh, UK leaving the Brexit uh, is a challenge. But as I also see that uh, every country, and I'm sure UK would be looking at converting this challenge into an opportunity. Yes, it will be an economic challenge, but when you have the resolve and the resilience that you are going to take the country forward, even economically in the new environment, I'm sure United Kingdom will come across ways and opportunities. There will be a lot of opening with the non-European countries, both in terms of the economy, in terms of the trade, in terms of uh, the other facets. So there, that is going to be certainly an opening for them. And those will be all positive because uh, it is uh, the globalization in the world and, and with the economic interaction that are going to take place between various countries, there will be opportunity for uh, United Kingdom to revive its economy. Of course, uh, uh, at this point in time, uh, the coronavirus has put a little damper in the spirits and whatever plans uh, they may have. But then, as I said, um, every opportunity or every challenge brings across an opportunity. And I'm sure that they will find ways and means if they have the resolve, which I'm sure they do, as a nation and as a country, to come out stronger economically, uh, not just in their renewed relationship or revised relationship with the EU, but with the non-EU countries as well. Thank, thank you, sir. Um, I think we have the Finance Minister of India with us, sir. Uh, we have the student who's representing Nirmala Sitaramanji in the Prime Minister's uh, Special Summit. If you could uh, introduce yourself and then start. A very good evening, sir. Good evening. So my question is, who is your inspiration? You have been a great inspiration to all of us today. I just want to know who is your inspiration? Well, uh, I would like to say that uh, my father and my mother um, were uh, both great inspiration to me. Um, I spent my childhood in... Uh, uh, Bombay, now Mumbai, and uh, that is where my father was working when I was a child. And that probably gave me the inspiration somewhere, uh, the love of the sea. Uh, because later, my ambition in life became to become a doctor. And um, after I passed out of school in 1969, I actually joined the pre-medical uh, to um, in Delhi University to become a doctor. But then fate and destiny had something else in store. And I appeared for the ND exam, uh, got through the ND exam, and uh, became um, a, a naval officer. 
And that is when my father guided me because I was at a little dilemma as whether I should pursue my medical studies or indeed uh, join the NDA. And he said that, son, you have to follow your heart. You have to decide. I can guide and advise you, but the decision has to be yours. So I, um, as I've suggested to all of you, I took a decision at that point in time and I never looked back. Um, it was unfortunate that I lost my father uh, nearly 40 years ago when I was fairly young. And then uh, my mother has been uh, uh, an inspiration for me uh, because uh, not only she was a friend, philosopher and guide, uh, she was uh, like a rock. And uh, with her advice all along, uh, we were uh, unfortunate that we lost her two years ago. But these two people have had a major role in being the inspiration to me. And uh, somewhere I, I actually thought many times that, you know, as to uh, why did I leave my medical career and how did I fall for the seas? But later I realized that actually we all have in us, uh, in our veins actually, the same percentage of salt in our blood, which is the same percentage of the salt in the seas. So somewhere, uh, this is actually how humankind is linked to the oceans and the seas. And whenever you go back to the seas, whether to sail on them or merely watch them, you get the feeling of going back where you came from. So having seen the seas in my childhood, having uh, the salt spray and you know the smell of the sea, somewhere it came haunting back to me. And once I joined the Navy, there was no looking back. And there was one thing which, you know, I mentioned to you. When I joined the Navy, I wanted to be uh, professionally second to none. And I was fortunate, I would say, that, you know, right from the start, uh, as Rishabh was mentioning to you, uh, I was the best all-round cadet, got the telescope. Um, I uh, was the sword of honor of my course and so on. But that doesn't mean that it was a cakewalk at any stage. One had to work, work, work harder and harder every time, striving for excellence at every stage. And only then uh, could one uh, hope and aspire to be where I am. So the inspiration, as I said, came from my parents. And the rest is whatever little hard work that I put in. Thank you. Thank you for that, sir. Uh, but sir, before I let you go, unfortunately, fortunately, we have with us Amit Shah ji, uh, the person, the delegate who is representing Amit Shah. And it would be impossible for me to continue to be in this country if I were not to recognize our Honorable Home Minister. The student who is representing uh, Amit Shah, please, if you could introduce yourself and uh, then... Hello, uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah, just speak a little louder. Uh, yes, sir. Now, is it okay, sir? Yes. Uh, okay, so a very good evening or afternoon, I must say, and thank you, Rishabh, sir. It's been a uh, dream of mine to see you in physical, but I'm right now seeing you in digital. And thank you for introducing us to Admiral Dhawan, sir. So my question comes with uh, consideration to the position of the Chief of Defence Staff as it was appointed to respected sir, General Pippin Rawat. So as in part of the Indian Navy and the ones we call the insiders or the people who know a lot, do you think this position was totally necessary for the Indian government to put forward as a chief of defense staff? And yeah. how well has it affected towards all the sectors of the Indian Navy, Army? Well, I, I would say that um, it is uh, the uh, very right decision and a decision which uh, needed to be taken some years ago and has been taken now. And to make you understand why it is important uh, that we have a chief of uh, defense staff, it is to understand that two armies do not go to war. Neither do two navies or two air forces. Two nations or two countries go to war. And when countries go to war, the armed forces of the country have to unite and fight that war. And therefore, it has to be joint operations. So if we live with the thought that 
the army can fight with another army and win a war, then we are sadly mistaken. Because no single service can hope to fight and win a war on its own. It has to be joint operations. So when we are talking of joint operations, this is the jointry of the armed forces where you need to be joined. So just, I'm sure you're aware of this, some years back uh, when we decided to go joint, and since then we have an integrated defense uh, services headquarters, which has been manned with a three-star general from the army, Air Force, uh, uh, an air marshal, or indeed uh, a vice admiral from the Navy. And this has been what has been providing the integration, but we did not have the head of the organization. The head of the organization remained one of the serving chiefs who was called the chief of the uh, staff security. So here, here we had a situation, the uh, chairman chiefs of staff committee was one of the serving chiefs. Now you can well imagine that if you have to do the joint uh, work as well and also be handling your own service, you cannot do justice because firstly, you are wearing and you will be swayed by the color of your uniform. The chief of defense staff, by my understanding, does not wear either the army, air force or naval uniform. He has to think purple. He has to think joint. And that is what uh, General Bipin Rawat, who is an outstanding officer, is doing at this point in time. He is the chief of defense staff. He is not colored by any color of the uniform. He thinks purple. He thinks for the armed forces of the country. He thinks of joint in operations so that the major role whenever we go to war, it will be the armed forces who will be fighting the war together and not individually each service. So that is the necessity of uh, the Chief of Defense Staff and a very right decision and a very right choice and the right person to be heading. Well, thank you for that answer, sir, and thank you for spending time with all of us. Um, we've, uh, we've troubled you for far too long, and uh, therefore, at this juncture, I know there are very many of you who have questions, uh, but unfortunately, we, I have I've given my word uh, to somebody who served us distinctly that we will leave him at a particular time. So I think the least we can do uh, for a man who is given and devoted his life uh, to the country is to is is to stick to our word so uh, so as i uh, the, the final thought that i'd uh, leave uh, everyone with on this session is that you know a good navy is not a provocation to war this is something that theodore roosevelt said he said a good navy is not a provocation to war it is the surest guarantee of peace so sir uh, thank you for keeping our country at peace whilst you served and thank you for being such a great ambassador for our country uh, it is a pleasure and an absolute honor to be able to hear from you about India, about coronavirus, about positivity, about your life. I do hope uh, for, on behalf of all of us, I would like to just say that a conversation with a knowledgeable person is better than reading a hundred books. Uh, doesn't mean that you guys don't read books. Um, that's, that quote is only applicable to me. Uh, therefore, sir, thank you for doing what you have done. And I do hope you accord us the opportunity of uh, facilitating this in the foreseeable future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rishab. It's been uh, a great pleasure uh, interacting with what I call, as I said, the leaders of tomorrow. Very knowledgeable uh, youngsters. And uh, I, I am very, very impressed uh, by all the questions that were asked. And uh, certainly, uh, this is only the uh, beginning of our interaction. And I very much look forward to uh, interacting with the uh, family members of the IIMUN uh, in, in the near future. So thank you for uh, all the um, preparation and the coordination you've done to make this possible. It has been a pleasure for me.